Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me let me move away my bits of bicycle chain. That's what I was doing this morning. Um, and let us refocus ourselves on uh, these bad boys here. Um, these, just in case you can't read, are of course the D orbitals. There were five of them for reasons that I'm hoping is familiar to you now. The reason there's five of them is because the ML values, negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, plus two, um, why was ML all these ranges? Because L was 2, which means the d orbitals. And L was 2 because you can have L being 0 up to n minus 1. And we're now on the third row of the periodic table. That's a mouthful recap. Um, so there are five uh, d orbitals. I did show you these at the time. Um, I did point out, I think I pointed out, I meant to, the fact that uh, three of them, are lying between the axes at 45 degrees um, to them, and two are by on the axes. I said, hmm, I wonder if that'll be important later. Well, if we were in the lab, what I want to look at today, by the way, is I want to look at two things. I want to have a look at names of transition metal complexes. So naming complexes, oh, jeez. Get a pen that people can see, that would help, hey. Naming complexes. That's one thing I want to talk about. And the other is I want to talk about colour in complexes. And as I said, if we were in the lab, I would have a beautiful beaker of sky blue copper 2 sulphate as a prop. Not just as a prop. I would do a demonstration with it later on as well. I can't, so you don't have to picture it. Go and Google it. A lovely blue, um, light blue copper sulphate solution. You've used it for a million years up and down the school. We're going to have a look at it today in a slightly more detail. We'll come back to the d orbitals as well later on. Um, it turns out these are responsible for colours. But before we do all that, let's look at the slightly mind-numbing process of how to name a complex. I, I've got a feeling I kept... Yeah, I did keep the complexes from the other week. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how you would name these complexes. These are the rules that I have um, appropriated from the Scholar PDF document. You'll find there are seven rules. If you want to learn this, as I said, uh, feel free. You know, if you're the type that learns this sort of stuff very easily, then that's grand. Um, it's worth one mark, though, in the final exam. So I'm going to leave you entirely to see whether you think it's worth your time or not. I'm not going to judge. Um, I am going to teach you, though, because that's what they pay me for. Um, so what we're supposed to do, it says here, the symbol of the metal is written first, following the symbols of the ligands, followed by, sorry, the symbols of the ligands in alphabetical order. So, uh, according to which atom of the ligand binds for water, as a ligand OH2 is used, since it is the oxygen atom that binds the metal, interestingly. Um, formula of the complex is enclosed within square brackets. I see I was dribbling this into you last time. That's what I said square brackets are for, with the charge outside the square brackets. Uh, ligands are named in alphabetical order, Followed by uh, the name, followed by the name of the metal and its oxidation state. If there's more than one of the ligand, you have to prefix it with di tri tetra. If the ligand in an is a negative ion ending in ide, like chloride, for example, then we change, we chop off uh, the e and we replace it with an o. So chloride becomes chloride o when it's a ligand, of course. So if chlorine was a ligand, which is not in my example, so I'll try and cook one up, it becomes chloridal, and cyanide becomes cyanido. Why do they bother doing this? I think it's just to emphasise the fact that the cyanide is not the counter ion, like potassium cyanide. It's actually part of the transition metal complex. If one of the ligands is ammonia, it's named as amine, with a double M, by the way, not with a single M because they are amines in the organic section. We'll come back to that. And water is, for goodness knows what reason, it turned into aqua. Maybe it's easier to say. Who can say? If the overall complex is negative, then you stick eight at the end of it. So if you had a cobalt complex that was negative, we would actually call it cobaltate. Just to add fun and games to that, we don't turn copper into copperate. We use the Latin name. Cuprate and ferrate for iron. This is all in the SQA rules as well, believe it or not. These guys as scholar are not making this more difficult. Um, and if if the complex is a salt, the name of the positive ion precedes the name of the negative ion. Let's 
let's do a couple of examples on all this, okay? We had, let's zoom back out again, hey. Brilliant, okay. So we had uh, these two examples last time. Let's go with uh, brown for the naming of the complex. Um, they're both iron complexes. Let's do this one first. So in order to name this, I see the complex here is negative, so it will be sodium something something something. Um, let's do the something 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 first and we'll stick a couple of sodiums in front of it. We've got iron. Uh, the complex is negative, so it doesn't become iron and it will be turned into ferrate. Um, we've got three, so we need tri, and they would be oxalate ions, but if you remember, we chop off the E and turn it into oxalato. So this will be tri oxalato ferrate. They said you needed to put the oxidation state of the metal, not that charge, by the way, it's not that charge, it's the oxidation number of this, if it was by itself. Now, if I can rewind on how to do that, uh, we can do it algebraically, can't we? Let's have a nice pink pen for this. So this is X. Hopefully you can, no, that's not very visible, is it? Let's do this. So there's X. Um, and each of these has a charge of 2 minus. So x plus 3 lots of negative 2 comes to negative 3. Um, that means if we take this over this side, this becomes positive uh, 6. So that means iron has got an oxidation number of 3. So we would put 2, 3. And very last of all, we have the counter ion that comes at the start. And I'll do that in blue. So this would be sodium trioxalatoferrate 3. That's how you do this. If you want to, of course. This one here, well, uh, the complex is now positive. So we don't need to worry about changing it to ferrate and an 8 on the end. This is a positive complex, so therefore it's going to be iron. Uh, but there are six waters, so I'm an idiot. So we put that in front, just like we did here, trioxalatoferrate. So it's going to be hexa aqua iron. Believe it or not, yep, hexa aqua iron. Once again, we needed the oxidation number of the iron. Now that's neutral. Oh, it's just three. Okay. So I spun over that very quickly. Sorry, how do I know it's just three? Because if we did it algebraically again, that's the x plus six lots of nothing. There is no charge on water equals three plus. So therefore, x must be three plus. So hexa aqua iron three chloride. Sorry about that, guys. I'm running out of room for that. So that's hexa aqua iron three, not because that's three, because this would have an oxidation number of three. Very common mistake, that one. Hexa aqua iron 3 chloride, because that's your counter ions. That sound okay? <laughs> um, I'll go back to this sheet for a second, because I had outlined at the bottom here, uh, with a nice pink arrow, the ones that uh, the SQA would love you to know about. They want you to know about ammonia as a ligand becomes amine. All the halogens, the name remains the same, you just chop the E off the end and stick an O on it. Cyanide becomes cyanido. Hydroxide, which wasn't mentioned here, but the SQA do say it, becomes hydroxido, believe it or not. Um, oxalate, like I did, becomes oxalato, and water is just aqua. There are some nice examples at the bottom there. We should probably zoom into them a bit more. There we go. Uh, let me keep this flat on the page. So we've got a copper, and we've got... Uh, oh, interestingly, actually, I mean, technically speaking, I did my water wrongly, didn't I? That'll be interesting if they actually pick up on that. Because you're supposed to show the oxygen first. Ah, I screwed up, hey. Screwed up, silly old fool. So, copper, four lots of water. Um, the waters are neutral, so therefore the charge here will just be the same as the copper itself. So, that's tetra aqua copper two. Um, hexa amine cobalt two. 
Uh, this one here, cyanide, has a charge of 1 minus. Um, how do I know this? You just have to remember it, I'm afraid. Um, so there's 6 1 minuses here, and it's 4 minus overall, so that must have been 2 for the iron. So this would be hexacyanidoferrate 2. Because the 2 is on the iron itself. See what you make of that, guys. I'll zoom back out. Excuse me, we sir. So that's how to name these horrendous things. <coughs> My apologies. Colour. What causes our colour, our copper to be beautiful blue colour? Well, um, sorry guys, just two seconds, I need a pen. Right, so let's have a look at copper two ions just for a second. Their electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s2. That takes us along to uh, beryllium. Uh, 2p6 takes us all the way to neon. 3s2. 3p6, that takes us down to argon. And then it was that weird thing where 4s2 fills first. And copper is the ninth one along in the transition metal block of 10. So therefore, it's 3d9. Perhaps we should swap these round, of course, because once the electrons filled them up, then they became the correct order, because we're going to need to take two out of this again. And the two we remove are the 4s electrons. So there are no 4s electrons, they are gone, so we're left with 3d9. They're the outer electrons in copper. Um, we could write them, of course. Like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And this is totally true for a copper ion with a charge of 2 plus sitting in a vacuum in space. <laughs> we don't do many of our experiments in a vacuum in space. Most of them are done in a glass of water in the lab. And what happens to the copper, of course, is now we know that when you put ions into water, then you get this lovely little hexagonal, octagonal, sorry, I apologise, octahedral even. Octagonal? That's two dimensions, hey. You get this nice octahedral thing, this complex forming, where you have got a little, a little water molecule stuck on by a data bond to each of these six points. So it's not quite as simple as a glass of copper ions floating about in the water. They have actually bonded to the water and formed a nice, oops, sorry, forgot that one, formed a nice complex hexa aqua copper two, actually, is what my glass contains. Again, so what? What difference does that make? Well, see the isolated iron? It looks like this, and it would be completely colourless. Because in order to have a colour, then you must be able to promote one of these electrons to a higher energy level orbital. Now the next level up has a huge gap, massive gap, and uh, that would be possible if you hit it with ultraviolet, yeah. But because we can see the colour with our eyeballs, we're talking about a much smaller gap, and there is nothing. Surely this is, these are all degenerate, aren't they? They are only degenerate for isolated ions. So this is true for copper 2 plus in a vacuum. Um, excuse me, the printer's just beeping at me there. So this is the electronic configuration for copper 2 plus in a vacuum. Look at this. See these 5D orbitals? They all overlap with each other. They all exist around one point, which is very tricky to imagine. But if you take the centre point of each of these and bring them into one centre point, you will hopefully see that here and here, and here, here, and here, are the lines here. So that's that, and these four are the equatorial ones. So there are d orbitals here where the water is binding to them, and there are no binds to these d orbitals here. There's n they're not getting in the way of anything, as it were. These are sort of these orbitals are obstructing the water molecules. They've got their own orbitals, of course, as well. So there's a bit of a conflict. These two Ds get elevated to a slightly less stable energy. And these three Ds stay where they used to be. 
So instead of this nice little arrangement here where all the Ds are the same energy level, they're all degenerate, that is no longer the case. And you end up with three D orbitals at a slightly lower energy and two D orbitals at a slightly higher energy. Caused by the fact that two of the D orbitals are on the axes, whereas three are between the axes. And the axes are where these are bonding on to. So there's a conflict. And this creates a small energy gap. Which, coincidentally, just happens to exist around about the 400 to 700 nanometer range. And therefore, we've got our nine electrons. They're all still in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But look, you can hit, say, this one, for example, randomly, with a photon. If the photon has sufficient energy to match this gap, that electron will fly up to there and some of your light will go missing. Whichever energy value this is, that will disappear and you'll see the complementary colour on the colour wheel. And that is why your copper ions are that lovely light blue colour. Okay, so the phrase the SQA uses is that colour in transition metal ions are caused by DD transitions. In other words, you're promoting electrons from somewhere in the d orbitals to another space elsewhere in the d orbitals. How does this energy gap suddenly materialize? Why are they no longer degenerate? They're no longer degenerate because the incoming ligands, orbitals, interfere with two of the d orbitals and create a small energy gap. Just coincidentally, as I said, is in the range that we can see. Now, um, there was one more point I was going to make. Oh, I know what I was going to make. Is it possible for a transition metal to have no colour then? And the answer is there are two situations where your transition metal would be colourless. The SQA love to ask about this. I don't suppose you could put your mind to that. Pause the video for a second and put your mind to that. What situations would you not be able to get promotion of an electron from here into here? There are two situations where that can occur. If you're back with us after pausing the video, I'm hoping that you can realise that if the d orbitals are completely full up, I don't know why I'm writing that, it would be easier to draw it. So if your d orbitals are completely full or completely empty, those are the two situations where you will end up having no colour. For very different reasons, I suppose. If they're completely empty, there are no electrons to promote. And if your d orbitals are completely full up, then you can hit it with energy all day long. There's nowhere for the electron to go. Two examples of that in the real world would be, um, if they're completely full up, that would be zinc, two plus ions. And if they're completely empty, that would be titanium, two plus ions. Um, the order is scandium titanium. So this guy, Oh, titanium 4 plus, I do apologise, sorry, very, very sorry folks, titanium 4 plus, just realised what I was saying there. Um, the order, of course, would be 4s2, 3d2 for titanium atoms, and if you lose 4 electrons, you'll lose the 4s, and you'll also lose the 3ds. So therefore, your d orbitals will look like that, that's it. Zinc has 4s2, 3d10, because it's the very last uh, of the transition metals which means if you have zinc 2+, plus, you'll knock out your 4s electrons, they will be lost, but then your 3d will look like this. Actually, no, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> it looks like that in an isolated atom. It looks like this in a glass of water. And your situation for d's is going to be entirely full up. Ooh, nearly broke. Uh, Hunch rule there. There we go. Um, so you can try and promote this all day. It's not going to happen. Could you promote one of these electrons into a much, much higher orbital? Oh, yeah, you could, but that's going to need something outside the visible range because the energy is too high. Um, one last thing before I stop talking today. I had planned to do catalysis today as well, but this is a bit of a mouthful, so I don't know. Should I? I could maybe squeeze it in. Um, is this split here, the split in the d orbitals, this delta E here, is this fixed and permanent? 
it is not. That delta E can be made larger or made smaller depending on your ligand. So if I was in the classroom at this point, I would have my lovely blue glass, light blue glass of copper sulfate in water, and then I would dunk in a large quantity of my least favorite chemical in the universe, concentrated ammonia. And you get an instant color change from light blue to really intense violet color. Go and look it up on YouTube. It's quite cool to see. We'll do it when we're back in August. We'll do it in the classroom. And the reason for that different color is because water does not split the d orbitals in the same way as ammonia doesn't. Of course it doesn't because they're different atoms. So different ligands produce different splits. And the SQA interestingly want you to know the term field splitting. They say strong field ligands create a large split. So this would be like a strong field ligand. You're not required to know which is which by the way. Uh, they just want you to know that it is a thing. Um, and the small split would be a weak field ligand. All the stuff's in the documents, guys. Go and have a look uh, if you think I'm rambling too much, which I probably am. I apologise. Um, the last thing I wanted to tackle is catalysis. Can I just pause the video for just two seconds? And we're back with catalysis and transition metals. They are famous. These guys here are famous for being wonderful catalysts. There's a nickel in making, I can't believe it's not butter. There's um, iron in the Haber process, platinum in the Oswald process. Sodium and magnesium never catalyze anything to the best of my knowledge. I, uh, so what is up with the transition metals? Why are they such good catalysts? Um, and also what the SQA want you to know about this? The SQA, first of all, want you to know about two different types of catalysts. I think Dr. Borthwick is very good at doing this. I skipped it. Sometimes she mentions it because it used to be in the higher syllabus and they shifted it to advanced higher. They want you to know, they being the SQA, heterogeneous. Gene eos. Okay, they want you to know about these two types of catalysts. Uh, best example I can give to you is probably a real world example. Homogeneous, homogeneous, uh, as in the same. In this case, it's the same physical state. So your catalyst is the same state as the stuff it's reacting with. The easiest one to imagine on that uh, would be enzymes in your blood because the enzymes are dissolved and the chemicals are dissolved that they're reacting with. So homogeneous catalysts are identical physical state, um, same physical state to whatever it's catalyzing. Heterogeneous or heterogeneous uh, are a different physical state. So an example of that would be oof, um, the exhaust inside your car. Uh, unless you're watching this in 20 years in the future, in which case they're probably all electric. But the exhaust inside your car um, has got long ceramic tubes. And the ceramic tubes are coated on the inside with a whole bunch of transition metals. A rhodium, a palladium, a platinum. Last year in London, there were thousands of uh, cases where people's cars were being jacked up overnight and the catalysts were being cut off and then sold as scrap metal because these the prices of these have skyrocketed. So how does it actually work? The SQA start using weasel words here because they use words like is thought to. So that translates as they're not entirely sure. Um, but they're saying that the presence of transition metals with the nice empty D orbitals. So there's the transition metals on the walls of the catalyst. And the, the phrase they use is, is thought to provide sites where you can form activated complexes. So here's a passing carbon monoxide molecule. It sticks onto uh, the wall of this uh, tube here, which because the oxygen and the carbon can bond they're saying to form an activated complex with the d orbitals and the transition metals. Um, that makes sense, I suppose, uh, because that would explain why things like calcium and sodium don't catalyze anything, because they don't have any d orbitals. Uh, well, they don't have any electrons in the d orbitals, I should say. And then you can turn it into carbon monoxide dioxide, sorry, and then it clears off. This clears off, fires out your car exhaust pipe as a nice harmless CO2. Well, unless you're on the planet Earth, of course. Um, and then you can rinse and repeat the process. You can just keep going on that. Uh, look up the documentation for the SQA if you want to learn their words, but that's, that's the last content. Thank you for listening.
Bye-bye.